Evagrios the Solitary Outline Teaching on Asceticism and Stillness in the Solitary Life In Jeremiah it is said, And you shall not take a wife in this place, for thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters born in this place, They shall die grievous deaths. Jeremiah 16, 1-4 through This shows that, in the words of the Apostle, He that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is inwardly divided. And she that is married cares for the things of the world, and how she may please her husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 32-34 It is clear that the statement in Jeremiah, They shall die grievous deaths, refers not only to the sons and daughters born as a result of marriage, but also to those born in the heart, that is, to worldly thoughts and desires. These too will die from the weak and sickly spirit of this world, and will have no place in heavenly life. On the other hand, as the Apostle says, He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7.32 And he produces the fruits of eternal life, which always keep their freshness. Such is the solitary. He should therefore abstain from women and not beget a son or daughter in the place of which Jeremiah speaks. He must be a soldier of Christ, detached from material things, free from cares, and not involved in any trade or commerce. For, as the Apostle says, in order to please the leader who has chosen him, the soldier, going to war, does not entangle himself in the affairs of this world. 2 Timothy 2, 4 Let the monk follow this course, especially since he has renounced the materiality of this world in order to win the blessings of stillness. For the practice of stillness is full of joy and beauty, its yoke is easy, and its burden light. Do you desire, then, to embrace this life of solitude and to seek out the blessings of stillness? If so, abandon the cares of the world and the principalities and powers that lie behind them. Free yourself from attachment to material things, from domination by passions and desires, so that, as a stranger to all this, you may attain true stillness. For only by raising himself above these things can a man achieve the life of stillness. Keep to a sparse and plain diet, not seeking a variety of tempting dishes. Should the thought come to you of getting extravagant foods in order to give hospitality, dismiss it. Do not be deceived by it. For in it the enemy lies in ambush, waiting to tear you away from stillness. Remember how the Lord rebukes Martha, the soul that is over busy with such things, when he says, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing alone is needful. Luke 10, 41-42 To hear the divine word, after that, one should be content with anything that comes to hand. He indicates all this by adding, Mary has chosen what is best, and it cannot be taken away from her. Luke 10:42. You also have the example of how the widow of Seraphath gave hospitality to the prophet. See 1 Kings 17, 9-16. If you have only bread, salt, or water, you can still meet the dues of hospitality. Even if you do not have these, but make the stranger welcome and say something helpful, you will not be failing in hospitality. For is not a word better than a gift? Ecclesiasticus 18.17 This is the view you should take of hospitality. Be careful, then, and do not desire wealth for giving to the poor, for this is another trick of the evil one, who often arouses self-esteem and fills your intellect with worry and restlessness. Think of the widow mentioned in the gospel by our Lord. With two mites she surpassed the generous gifts of the wealthy. For he says, They cast into the treasury out of their abundance. But she, 
cast in all her livelihood. Mark 12.44 With regard to clothes, be content with what is sufficient for the needs of the body. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Psalms 55.22 And He will provide for you, since He cares for you. 1 Peter 5.7 If you need food or clothes, do not be ashamed to accept what others offer you. To be ashamed to accept is a kind of pride. But if you have more than you require, give to those in need. It is in this way God wishes His children to manage their affairs. That is why, writing to the Corinthians, the Apostle said about those who were in want, Your abundance should supply their want, so that their abundance likewise may supply your want. And there will be equality, as it is written, He that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. 2 Corinthians 8, 14-15 and Exodus 16, 18 So, if you have all you need for the moment, do not be anxious about the future, whether it is one day ahead or a week or months. For when tomorrow comes, it will supply what you need, if you seek above all else the kingdom of heaven and the righteousness of God. For the Lord says, Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things as well will be given to you. See Matthew 6.33 Do not have a servant, for if you do, you will no longer have only yourself to provide for. And in that case, the enemy may trip you up through the servant and disturb your mind with worries about laying in extravagant foods. Should you have the thought of getting a servant to allow your body a little ease, call to mind what is more important, I mean, spiritual peace. For spiritual peace is certainly more important than bodily ease. Even if you have the idea that taking a servant would be for the servant's benefit, do not accept it. For this is not our work. It is the work of others, of the Holy Fathers, who live in communities and not as solitaries. Think only of what is best for yourself, and safeguard the way of stillness. Do not develop a habit of associating with people who are materially minded and involved in worldly affairs. Live alone, or else with brethren who are detached from material things and of one mind with yourself. For if one associates with materially-minded people involved in worldly affairs, one will certainly be affected by their way of life and will be subject to social pressures, to vain talk, and every other kind of evil, anger, sorrow, passion for material things, fear, or scandals. Do not get caught up in concern for your parents or affection for your relatives. On the contrary, avoid meeting them frequently in case they rob you of the stillness you have in your cell and involve you in their own affairs. Let the dead bury their dead, says the Lord, but come, follow me. See Matthew 8.22 If you find yourself growing strongly attached to your cell, leave it. Do not cling to it. Be ruthless. Do everything possible to attain stillness and freedom from distraction and struggle to live according to God's will, battling against invisible enemies. If you cannot attain stillness where you now live, consider living in exile and try to make up your mind to go. Be like an astute businessman. Make stillness your criterion for testing the value of everything and choose always what contributes to it. Indeed, I urge you to welcome exile. It frees you from all the entanglements of your own locality and allows you to enjoy the blessings of stillness undistracted. Do not stay in a town, but persevere in the wilderness. Lo, says the psalm, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Psalms 55, 7
if possible, do not visit a town at all, for you will find there nothing of benefit, nothing useful, nothing profitable for your way of life. To quote the psalm again, I have seen violence and strife in the city. Psalms 55, 9. So seek out places that are free from distraction and solitary. Do not be afraid of the noises you may hear. Even if you should see some demonic fantasy, do not be terrified or flee from the training ground so apt for your progress. Endure fearlessly, and you will see the great things of God, His help, His care, and all the other assurances of salvation. For as the psalm says, I waited for Him who delivers me from distress of spirit and the tempest. Psalms 55, 8 Do not let restless desire overcome your resolution, for restlessness of desire perverts the guileless intellect. Wisdom 4, 12 Many temptations result from this. For fear that you may go wrong, stay rooted in your cell. If you have friends, avoid constant meetings with them. For if you meet only on rare occasions, you will be of more help to them. And if you find that harm comes through meeting them, do not see them at all. The friends that you do have should be of benefit to you and contribute to your way of life. Avoid associating with crafty or aggressive people and do not live with anyone of that kind, but shun their evil purposes, for they do not dwell close to God or abide with Him. Let your friends, be men of peace, spiritual brethren, holy fathers. It is of such that the Lord speaks when He says, My mother and brethren and fathers are those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. See Matthew 12, 49-50 Do not pass your time with people engaged in worldly affairs or share their table in case they involve you in their illusions and draw you away from the science of stillness, for this is what they want to do. Do not listen to their words or accept the thoughts of their hearts, for they are indeed harmful. Let the labor and longing of your heart be for the faithful of the earth, to become like them in mourning. For my eyes will be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. Psalms 101. 6. If someone who lives in accordance with the love of God comes to you and invites you to eat, go, if you wish, but return quickly to your cell. If possible, never sleep outside your cell, so that the gift of stillness may always be with you. Then you will be unhindered on your chosen path. Do not hanker after fine foods and deceitful pleasures. For she that indulges in pleasure is dead while still alive, as the Apostle says. 1 Timothy 5, 6 Do not fill your belly with other people's food in case you develop a longing for it, and this longing makes you want to eat at their table. For it is said, Do not be deceived by the filling of the belly. Proverbs 24, 15 if you find yourself continually invited outside your cell, decline the invitations, for continual absence from your cell is harmful. It deprives you of the grace of stillness, darkens your minds, withers your longing for God. If a jar of wine is left in the same place for a long time, the wine in it becomes clear, settled, and fragrant. But if it is moved about, the wine becomes turbid and dull tainted throughout by the lees. So you too should stay in the same place, and you will find how greatly this benefits you. Do not have relationships with too many people, lest your intellect becomes distracted and so disturbs the way of stillness. Provide yourself with such work for your hands as can be done, if possible, both during the day and at night, so that you are not a burden to anyone, and indeed can give to others as Paul the Apostle advises. See 1 Thessalonians 2, 9.
and Ephesians 4.28. In this manner, you will overcome the demon of listlessness and drive away all the desires suggested by the enemy. For the demon of listlessness takes advantage of idleness. Every idle man is full of desires. Proverbs 13, 4. When buying or selling, you can hardly avoid sin. So, in either case, be sure you lose a little in the transaction. Do not haggle about the price from love of gain and so indulge in actions harmful to the soul, quarreling, lying, shifting your ground, and so on, thus bringing our way of life into disrepute. Understanding things in this manner, be on your guard when buying and selling. If possible, it is best to place such business in the hands of someone you trust, so that, being thus relieved of the worry, you can pursue your calling with joy and hope. In addition to all that I have said so far, you should consider now other lessons which the way of stillness teaches, and do what I tell you. Sit in your cell and concentrate your intellect. Remember the day of death. Visualize the dying of your body. Reflect on this calamity. Experience the pain. Reject the vanity of this world, its compromises and crazes, so that you may continue in the way of stillness and not weaken. Call to mind also what is even now going on in hell. Think of the suffering, the bitter silence, the terrible moaning, the great fear and agony, the dread of what is to come, the unceasing pain, the endless weeping. Remember, too, the day of your resurrection and how you will stand before God. Imagine that fearful and awesome judgment seat. Picture all that awaits those who sin, their shame before God the Father and His anointed, before angels, archangels, principalities, and all mankind. Think of all the forms of punishment, the eternal fire, the worm that does not die, the abyss of darkness, the gnashing of teeth, the terrors, and the torments. Then, picture all the blessings that await the righteous, intimate communion with God the Father and His anointed, with angels, archangels, principalities, and all the saints, the kingdom and its gifts, the gladness and the joy. Picture both these states. Lament and weep for the sentence passed on sinners. Mourn while you are doing this, frightened that you too may be among them. But rejoice and be glad at the blessings that await the righteous and aspire to enjoy them and to be delivered from the torments of hell. See to it that you never forget these things, whether inside your cell or outside it. This will help you escape thoughts that are defiling and harmful. Fast before the Lord according to your strength, for to do this will purge you and your iniquities and sins. It exalts the soul, sanctifies the mind, drives away the demons, and prepares you for God's presence. Having already eaten once, try not to eat a second time the same day, in case you become extravagant and disturb your mind. In this way, you will have the means for helping others and for mortifying the passions of your body. But, if there is a meeting of the brethren, and you have to eat a second and a third time, do not be disgruntled and surly. On the contrary, do gladly what you have to do, and when you have eaten a second or a third time, thank God that you have fulfilled the law of love and that He Himself is providing for you. Also, there are occasions when, because of a bodily sickness, you have to eat a second and a third time or more often. Do not be sad about this. When you are ill, you should modify your ascetic labors for the time being, so that you may regain the strength to take them up once more. As far as abstinence from food is concerned, the Divine Logos did not prohibit the eating of anything, but said, See, even as I have given you the green herb, I have given you all things. Eat, asking no questions, 
It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. See Genesis 9, 3, 1 Corinthians 10, 25, and Matthew 15, 11. To abstain from food, then, should be a matter of our own choice and an ascetic labor. Gladly bear vigils, sleeping on the ground and all other hardships, looking to the glory that will be revealed to you and to all the saints. For the sufferings of this present time, says the Apostle, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8.18 If you are disheartened, pray, as the Apostle says, see James 5.13, pray with fear, trembling, effort, with inner watchfulness and vigilance. To pray in this manner is especially necessary because the enemies are so malignant. For it is just when they see us at prayer that they come and stand beside us, ready to attack, suggesting to our intellect the very things we should not think about when praying. In this way, they try to take our intellect captive and to make our prayer and supplication vain and useless. For prayer is truly vain and useless when not performed with fear and trembling, with inner watchfulness and vigilance. When someone approaches an earthly king, he entreats him with fear, trembling and attention. So much the more, then, should we stand and pray in this manner before God the Father, the Master of all, and before Christ, the King of kings. For it is He whom the whole spiritual host and the choir of angels serve with fear and glorify with trembling, and they sing an unceasing praise to Him, together with the Father who has no origin, and with the all-holy and co-eternal Spirit, now and ever, through all the ages. Amen. Evagrios the Solitary Texts on Discrimination in Respect of Passions and Thoughts 1. Of the demons opposing us in the practice of the ascetic life, there are three groups who fight in the front line. Those entrusted with the appetites of gluttony, those who suggest avaricious thoughts, and those who incite us to seek the esteem of men. All the other demons follow behind and in their turn attack those already wounded by the first three groups. For one does not fall into the power of the demon of unchastity, unless one has first fallen because of gluttony, nor is one's anger aroused unless one is fighting for food or material possessions or the esteem of men. And one does not escape the demon of dejection unless one no longer experiences suffering when deprived of these things, nor will one escape pride, the first offspring of the devil, unless one has banished avarice the root of all evil, since poverty makes a man humble, according to Solomon. See Proverbs 10.4. In short, no one can fall into the power of any demon unless he has been wounded by those of the front line. That is why the devil suggested these three thoughts to the Savior. First, he exhorted him to turn stones into bread. Then he promised him the whole world if Christ would fall down and worship him. And thirdly, he said that, if our Lord would listen to him, he would be glorified and suffer nothing in falling from the pinnacle of the temple. But our Lord, having shown himself superior to these temptations, commanded the devil to get behind him. In this way, he teaches us that it is not possible to drive away the devil unless we scornfully reject these three thoughts. See Matthew 4, 1 through 10. 2. All thoughts inspired by the demons produce within us conceptions of sensory objects, and in this way the intellect, with such conceptions imprinted on it, bears the forms of these objects within itself. So, by recognizing the object presented to it, the intellect knows which demon is approaching. For example, if the face of a person who has done me harm or insulted me appears in my mind, 
I recognize the demon of rancor approaching. If there is a suggestion of material things or of esteem, again it will be clear which demon is troubling me. In the same way, with other thoughts, we can infer from the object appearing in the mind which demon is close at hand, suggesting that object to us. I do not say that all thoughts of such things come from the demons, for when the intellect is activated by man, it is its nature to bring forth the images of past events. But all thoughts producing anger or desire, in a way that is contrary to nature, are caused by demons. For through demonic agitation, the intellect mentally commits adultery and becomes incensed. Thus, it cannot receive the vision of God, who sets us in order, for the divine splendor only appears to the intellect during prayer, when the intellect is free from conceptions of sensory objects. 3. Man cannot drive away impassioned thoughts unless he watches over his desire and insensive power. He destroys desire through fasting, vigils, and sleeping on the ground, and he tames his insensive power through long suffering forbearance, forgiveness, and acts of compassion. For with these two passions are connected almost all the demonic thoughts which lead the intellect to disaster and perdition. It is impossible to overcome these passions unless we can rise above attachment to food and possessions, to self-esteem, and even to our very body, because it is through the body that the demons often attempt to attack us. It is essential, then, to imitate people who are in danger at sea and throw things overboard because of the violence of the winds and the threatening waves. But here we must be very careful in case we cast things overboard just to be seen doing so by men. For then we shall get the reward we want. But we shall suffer another shipwreck, worse than the first, blown off our course by the contrary wind of the demon of self-esteem. That is why our Lord, instructing the intellect, our helmsman, says in the Gospels, Take heed that you do not give alms in front of others to be seen by them, for unless you take heed, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Again, he says, When you pray, you must not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and at street corners so as to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they get the reward they want. Moreover, when you fast, do not put on a gloomy face like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, so that they may be seen by men to be fasting. Truly, I say to you, they get the reward they want. See Matthew 6, 1-18 Observe how the physician of souls here corrects our insensive power through acts of compassion, purifies the intellect through prayer, and through fasting withers desire. By means of these virtues, the new Adam is formed, made again according to the image of his Creator, an Adam in whom, thanks to dispassion, there is neither male nor female, and thanks to singleness of faith, there is neither Greek nor Jew circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Galatians 3, 28 and Colossians 3, 10 through 11. 4. We shall now inquire how, in the fantasies that occur during sleep, the demons imprint shapes and forms on our intellect. Normally, the intellect receives these shapes and forms either through the eyes when it is seeing, or through the ears when it is hearing, or through some other sense, or else through the memory, which stirs up and imprints on the intellect things which it has experienced through the body. Now, it seems to me that in our sleep, when the activity of our bodily senses is suspended, it is by arousing the memory that the demons make this imprint. But, in that case, how do the demons, 
arouse the memory? Is it through the passions? Clearly, this is so. For those in a state of purity and dispassion no longer experience demonic fantasies in sleep. There is also an activity of the memory that is not demonic. It is caused by ourselves or by the angelic powers, and through it we may meet with saints and delight in their company. We should notice, in addition, that during sleep the memory stirs up, without the body's participation, those very images which the soul has received in association with the body. This is clear from the fact that we often experience such images during sleep, when the body is at rest. Just as it is possible to think of water both while thirsty and while not thirsty, so it is possible to think of gold with greed and without greed. The same applies to other things. Thus, if we can discriminate in this way between one kind of fantasy and another, we can then recognize the artfulness of the demons. We should be aware, too, that the demons also use external things to produce fantasies, such as the sound of waves heard at sea. 5. When our insensive power is aroused in a way contrary to nature, it greatly furthers the aim of the demons, and is an ally in all their evil designs. Day and night, therefore, they are always trying to provoke it, and when they see it tethered by gentleness, they at once try to set it free on some seemingly just pretext. In this way, when it is violently aroused, they can use it for their shameful purposes, so it must not be aroused either for just or for unjust reasons, and we must not hand a dangerous sword to those readily incensed to wrath for it often happens that people become excessively worked up for quite trivial reasons. Tell me, why do you rush into battle so quickly? If you are really above caring about food, possessions, and glory, why keep a watchdog if you have renounced everything? If you do, and it barks and attacks other men, it is clear that there are still some possessions for it to guard. But. Since I know that wrath is destructive of pure prayer, the fact that you cannot control it shows how far you are from such prayer. I am also surprised that you have forgotten the saints. David, who exclaims, Cease from anger and put aside your wrath. Psalms 37, 8 And Ecclesiastes, who urges us, Remove wrath from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. Ecclesiastes 11, 10. While the Apostle commands that always and everywhere men should lift up holy hands without anger and without quarreling. 1 Timothy 2, 8. And do we not learn the same from the mysterious and ancient custom of putting dogs out of the house during prayer? This indicates that there should be no wrath in those who pray. Their wine is the wrath of serpents. Deuteronomy 32, 33 That is why the Nazarenes abstained from wine. It is needless to insist that we should not worry about clothes or food. The Savior himself forbids this in the Gospels. Do not worry about what to eat or drink or about what to wear. See Matthew 6.25 Such anxiety is a mark of the Gentiles and unbelievers who reject the providence of the Lord and deny the Creator. An attitude of this kind is entirely wrong for Christians who believe that even two sparrows which are sold for a farthing are under the care of the holy angels. See Matthew 10.29 the demons, however, after arousing impure thoughts, go on to suggest worries of this kind, so that Jesus conveys himself away because of the multitudes of concerns in our minds. See John 5.13 The divine word can bear no fruit, being choked by our cares. Let us then renounce these cares and throw them down before the Lord, being content with what we have at the moment, 
and living in poverty and rags, let us, day by day, rid ourselves of all that fills us with self-esteem. If anyone thinks it shameful to live in rags, he should remember St. Paul, who, in cold and nakedness, patiently awaited the crown of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11.27 and 2 Timothy 4.8 The apostle likened this world to a contest in an arena. See 1 Corinthians 9.24 How then can someone clothed with anxious thoughts run for the prize of the high calling of God? Philemon 3.14 Or wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Ephesians 6, 12. I do not see how this is possible. For just as a runner is obstructed and weighed down by clothing, so too is the intellect by anxious thoughts. If indeed the saying is true that the intellect is attached to its own treasure, for it is said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6. 21. 6. Sometimes thoughts are cut off, and sometimes they do the cutting off. Evil thoughts cut off good thoughts, and in turn are cut off by good thoughts. The Holy Spirit, therefore, notes to which thought we give priority and condemns or approves us accordingly. What I mean is something like this. The thought occurs to me to give hospitality, and it is for the Lord's sake. But when the tempter attacks, this thought is cut off, and in its place he suggests giving hospitality for the sake of display. Again, the thought comes to me of giving hospitality so as to appear hospitable in the eyes of others, but this thought, in its turn, is cut off when a better thought comes, which leads me to practice this virtue for the Lord's sake and not so as to gain esteem from men. 7. We have learnt, after much observation, to recognize the difference between angelic thoughts, human thoughts, and thoughts that come from demons. Angelic thought is concerned with the true nature of things and with searching out their spiritual essences. For example, Why was gold created and scattered like sand in the lower regions of the earth, to be found only with much toil and effort? And how, when found, is it washed in water and committed to the fire, and then put into the hands of craftsmen who fashion it into the candlestick of the tabernacle and the censers and the vessels? See Exodus 25, 22-39 from which, by the grace of our Savior, the king of Babylon no longer drinks. See Daniel 5, 2, and 3. A man such as Cleopas brings a heart burning with these mysteries. See Luke 24, 32. Demonic thought, on the other hand, neither knows nor can know such things. It can only shamelessly suggest the acquisition of physical gold looking forward to the wealth and glory that will come from this. Finally, human thought neither seeks to acquire gold nor is concerned to know what it symbolizes, but brings before the mind simply the image of gold with passion or greed. The same principle applies to other things as well. 8. There is a demon, known as the deluder, who visits the brethren, especially at dawn, and leads the intellect about from city to city, from village to village, from house to house, pretending that no passions are aroused through such visits, but then the intellect goes on to meet and talk with old acquaintances at greater length, and so allows its own state to be corrupted by those it encounters. Little by little it falls away from the knowledge of God and holiness, and forgets its calling. Therefore, the solitary must watch this demon, noting where he comes from and where he ends up. For this demon does not make this long circuit without purpose and at random, but because he wishes to corrupt the state of the solitary, so that his intellect, 
overexcited by all this wandering and intoxicated by its many meetings, may immediately fall prey to the demons of unchastity, anger, or dejection. The demons that above all others destroy its inherent brightness. But, if we really want to understand the cunning of this demon, we should not be hasty in speaking to him, or tell others what is taking place, how he is compelling us to make these visits in our mind, and how he is gradually driving the intellect to its death. For then he will flee from us, as he cannot bear to be seen doing this, and so we shall not grasp any of the things we are anxious to learn. But instead, we should allow him one more day, or even two, to play out his role, so that we can learn about his deceitfulness in detail. Then, mentally rebuking him, we put him to flight. But because during temptation the intellect is clouded and does not see exactly what is happening, do as follows after the demon has withdrawn. Sit down and recall in solitude the things that have happened, where you started and where you went, in what place you were seized by the spirit of unchastity, dejection, or anger, and how it all happened. Examine these things closely and commit them to memory so that you will then be ready to expose the demon when he next approaches you. Try to become conscious of the weak spot in yourself which he hid from you, and you will not follow him again. If you wish to engage him, expose him at once when he reappears, and tell him just where you went first, and where next, and so on, for he becomes very angry and cannot bear the disgrace. And the proof that you spoke to him effectively is that the thoughts he suggested leave you, for he cannot remain in action when he is openly exposed. The defeat of this demon is followed by heavy sleepiness and deadness, together with a feeling of great coldness in the eyelids, countless yawnings, and heaviness in the shoulders. But, if you pray intensely, all this is dispersed by the Holy Spirit. 9. Hatred against the demons contributes greatly to our salvation and helps our growth in holiness. But we do not of ourselves have the power to nourish this hatred into a strong plant, because the pleasure-loving spirits restrict it and encourage the soul again to indulge in its old habitual loves. But this indulgence, or rather this gangrene, that is so hard to cure, the physician of souls heals by abandoning us for he permits us to undergo some fearful suffering night and day, and then the soul returns again to its original hatred and learns, like David, to say to the Lord, I hate them with perfect hatred, I count them my enemies. Psalms 139, 22 For a man hates his enemies with perfect hatred when he sins neither in act nor in thought which is a sign of complete dispassion. 10. Now what am I to say about the demon who makes the soul obtuse? For I am afraid to write about him, how, at his approach, the soul departs from its own proper state and strips itself of reverence and the fear of God, no longer regarding sin as sin or wickedness as wickedness. It looks on judgment and the eternal punishment of hell as mere words. It laughs at the fire which causes the earth to tremble. And while supposedly confessing God, it has no understanding of His commandments. You may beat your breast as such a soul draws near to sin, but it takes no notice. You recite from the scripture, yet it is wholly indifferent and will not hear. You point out its shame and disgrace among men, and it ignores you like a pig that closes its eyes and charges through a fence. This demon gets into the soul by way of long-continuing thoughts of self-esteem, and unless those days are shortened, no flesh will be saved. Matthew 24, 22. This is one of those demons that seldom approach brethren living in a community. The reason is clear. When people around us fall into misfortune, 
or are afflicted by illness, or are suffering in prison, or meet sudden death, this demon is driven out. For the soul has only to experience even a little compunction or compassion, and the callousness caused by the demon is dissolved. We solitaries lack these things because we live in the wilderness and sickness is rare among us. It was to banish this demon especially that the Lord enjoined us in the Gospels to call on the sick and visit those in prison. For, I was sick, he says, and you visited me. Matthew 25.36 But you should know this. If an anchorite falls in with this demon, yet does not admit unchaste thoughts or leave his cell out of listlessness, this means he has received the patience and self-restraint that come from heaven and is blessed with dispassion. Those, on the other hand, who profess to practice godliness, yet choose to have dealings with people of the world, should be on their guard against this demon. I feel ashamed to say or write more about him. 11. All the demons teach the soul to love pleasure. Only the demon of dejection refrains from doing this, since he corrupts the thoughts of those he enters by cutting off every pleasure of the soul and drying it up through dejection. For the bones of the dejected are dried up. Proverbs 17.22 now, if this demon attacks only to a moderate degree, he makes the anchorite more resolute, for he encourages him to seek nothing worldly and to shun all pleasures. But when the demon remains for longer, he encourages the soul to give up or forces it to run away. Even Job was tormented by this demon, and it was because of this that he said, Oh, that I might lay hands upon myself or at least ask someone else to do this for me. Job 30, 24 The symbol of this demon is the viper. When used in moderation for man's good, its poison is an antidote against that of other venomous creatures. But when taken in excess, it kills whoever takes it. It was to this demon that Paul delivered the man at Corinth who had fallen into sin. That is why he quickly wrote again to the Corinthians, saying, Confirm your love towards him, lest perhaps he should be swallowed up with too great dejection. 2 Corinthians 2, 7-8 He knew that this spirit, in troubling men, can also bring about true repentance. It was for this reason that St. John the Baptist gave the name Progeny of Vipers to those who were goaded by this spirit to seek refuge in God, saying, Who has warned you to flee from the anger to come? Bring forth fruits then that testify to your repentance, and do not think that you can just say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Matthew 3, 7-9 But if a man imitates Abraham and leaves his country and kindred, See Genesis 12.1. He thereby becomes stronger than this demon. 12. He who has mastery over his insensive power has mastery also over the demons. But anyone who is a slave to it is a stranger to the monastic life and to the ways of our Savior. For as David said to the Lord, He will teach the gentle his ways. Psalms 25.9 The intellect of the solitary is hard for the demon to catch, for it shelters in the land of gentleness. There is scarcely any other virtue which the demons fear as much as gentleness. Moses possessed this virtue, for he was called very gentle above all men. Numbers 12.3 and David showed that it makes men worthy to be remembered by God when he said, Lord, remember David and all his gentleness. Psalms 132, 1. And the Savior himself also enjoined us to imitate him in his gentleness. 
saying, Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11.29 Now, if a man abstains from food and drink, but becomes incensed to wrath because of evil thoughts, he is like a ship sailing the open sea, with a demon for pilot. So we must keep this watchdog under careful control, training him to destroy only the wolves and not to devour the sheep, and to show the greatest gentleness towards all men. 13. In the whole range of evil thoughts, none is richer in resources than self-esteem, for it is to be found almost everywhere, and like some cunning traitor in a city, it opens the gates to all the demons. So it greatly debases the intellect of the solitary, filling it with many words and notions, and polluting the prayers through which he is trying to heal all the wounds of his soul. All the other demons, when defeated, combine to increase the strength of this evil thought, and through the gateway of self-esteem they all gain entry into the soul, thus making a man's last state worse than his first. See Matthew 12, 45. Self-esteem gives rise in turn to pride, which casts down from heaven to earth the highest of the angels, the seal of God's likeness, and the crown of all beauty. So turn quickly away from pride and do not dally with it, in case you surrender your life to others and your substance to the merciless. See Proverbs 5, 9. This demon is driven away by intense prayer and by not doing or saying anything that contributes to the sense of your own importance. 14. When the intellect of the solitary attains some small degree of dispassion, it mounts the horse of self-esteem and immediately rides off into cities, taking its fill of the lavish praise accorded to its repute. But by God's providence the spirit of unchastity now confronts it and shuts it up in a sty of dissipation. This is to teach it to stay in bed until it is completely recovered and not to act like disobedient patients, who, before they are fully cured of their disease, start taking walks and baths, and so fall sick again. Let us sit still and keep our attention fixed within ourselves, so that we may advance in holiness and resist vice more strongly. Awakened in this way to spiritual knowledge, we shall acquire contemplative insight into many things, and ascending still higher, we shall receive a clearer vision of the light of our Savior. 15. I cannot write about all the villainies of the demons, and I feel ashamed to speak about them at length and in detail for fear of harming the more simple-minded among my readers. But let me tell you about the cunning of the demon of unchastity. When a man has acquired dispassion in the appetitive part of his soul, and shameful thoughts cool down within him, this demon at once suggests images of men and women playing with one another, and makes the solitary a spectator of shameful acts and gestures. But this temptation need not be permanent, for intense prayer, a very frugal diet, together with vigils and the development of spiritual contemplation, drive it away like a light cloud. There are times when this cunning demon even touches the flesh, inflaming it to uncontrolled desire, and it devises endless other tricks which need not be described. Our insensive power is also a good defense against this demon. When it is directed against evil thoughts of this kind, such power fills the demon with fear and destroys his designs. And this is the meaning of the statement, Be angry and do not sin. Psalms 4.4 4. Such anger is a useful medicine for the soul at times of temptation. The demon of anger employs tactics resembling those of the demon of unchastity, for he suggests images of our parents, friends, or kinsmen being gratuitously insulted 
and in this way he excites our insensive power, making us say or do something vicious to those who appear in our minds. We must be on guard against these fantasies and expel them quickly from our mind. For if we dally with them, they will prove a blazing firebrand to us during prayer. People prone to anger are especially liable to fall into these temptations, and if they do, then they are far from pure prayer and from the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 16. As sheep to a good shepherd, the Lord has given to man intellections of this present world. For it is written, He has given intellection to the heart of every man. See Hebrews 10.16 To help man, he has given him insensive power and desire, so that with the first he may drive away wolf-like intellections, while with the second he may lovingly tend the sheep, even though he is often exposed to rains and winds. In addition, God has given man the law, so that he may shepherd the sheep. He has given him green pastures and refreshing water. See Psalms 23, 2. A psaltery and harp, a rod and a staff. In this way he gathers hay from the mountains and is fed and clothed from his flock. For it is written, Does anyone feed a flock and not drink its milk? 1 Corinthians 9, 7. Therefore the solitary ought to guard this flock night and day, making sure that none of the lambs is caught by wild beasts or falls into the hands of thieves. Should this happen in some valley, he must at once snatch the creature from the mouth of the lion or the bear. See 1 Samuel 17.35 What does it mean for the lambs to be caught by wild beasts? It means that when we think about our brother, we feed on hatred. When we think about a woman, we are moved with shameful lust. When we think about gold and silver, we are filled with greed. And likewise, when we think about gifts received from God, our mind is gorged with self-esteem. The same happens in the case of other intellections, if they are seized by the passions. We must not only guard this flock by day, but also keep watch at night. For by having fantasies of shameful and evil things, we may lose some of the sheep entrusted to us. And this is the meaning of Jacob's words, I did not bring you a sheep which was caught by wild beasts. I made good of myself the thefts of the day and the thefts of the night. I was parched with heat by day and chilled with frost by night, and sleep departed from my eyes. Genesis 31, 39 through 40. If a certain listlessness overtakes us as a result of our efforts, we should climb a little up the rock of spiritual knowledge and play on the harp, plucking the strings with the skills of such knowledge. Let us pasture our sheep below Mount Sinai, so that the God of our fathers may speak to us too, out of the bush, see Exodus 3, and show us the inner essence of signs and wonders. 17. Our spiritual nature, which had become dead through wickedness, is raised once more by Christ through the contemplation of all the ages of creation and through the spiritual knowledge that He gives of Himself. The Father raises the soul which has died the death of Christ. And this is the meaning of Paul's statement. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. See 2 Timothy 2, 11. 18. When the intellect has shed its fallen state and acquired the state of grace, then during prayer it will see its own nature like a sapphire or the color of heaven. In Scripture, this is called the realm of God that was seen by the elders on Mount Sinai. See Exodus 24, 10. 19. Of the unclean demons, some tempt man insofar as he is man, while others disturb him insofar as he is a non-rational animal. 
The first, when they approach us, suggest to us notions of self-esteem, pride, envy, or censoriousness, notions by which non-rational animals are not affected, whereas the second, when they approach, arouse insensive power and desire in a manner contrary to nature. For these passions are common to us and to animals and lie concealed beneath our rational and spiritual nature. Hence, the Holy Spirit says of the thoughts that come to men insofar as they are men, I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die as men and fall as one of the princes. Psalms 82, 6-7 but what does he say of the thoughts which stir in men non-rationally? Do not be as the horse and mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be controlled with a bit and bridle, in case they attack you. Psalms 32, 9 Now, if the soul that sins shall die, Ezekiel 18.4, it is clear that in so far as we die as men, we are buried as men, but in so far as we are slain or fall as non rational animals, we are devoured by vultures and ravens, whose young cry to the Lord. Psalms 147, 9, and roll themselves in blood. Job 39, 30. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 11.15 20. When one of the enemy approaches you and wounds you and you wish to turn his sword back into his own heart, see Psalms 37.15, then do as follows. Analyze in yourself the sinful thought that has wounded you, what it is, what it consists of, and what in it especially afflicts the intellect. Suppose, for instance, that a thought full of avarice is suggested to you. Distinguish between the component elements, the intellect which has accepted the thought, the intellection of gold, gold itself, and the passion of avarice. Then ask, in which of these does the sin consist? Is it the intellect? But how then can the intellect be the image of God? Is it the intellection of gold? But what sensible person would ever say that? Then, is gold itself the sin? In that case, why was it created? It follows, then, that the cause of the sin is the fourth element, which is neither an objective reality nor the intellection of something real, but is a certain noxious pleasure which, once it is freely chosen, compels the intellect to misuse what God has created. It is this pleasure that the law of God commands us to cut off. Now, as you investigate the thought in this way and analyze it into its components, it will be destroyed, and the demon will take to flight once your mind is raised to a higher level by this spiritual knowledge. But before using his own sword against him, you may choose first to use your sling against him. Then take a stone from your shepherd's bag and sling it. See 1 Samuel 17. By asking these questions, How is it that angels and demons affect our world whereas we do not affect their worlds? For we cannot bring the angels closer to God, and we cannot make the demons more impure. And how was Lucifer, the morning star, cast down to the earth, see Isaiah 14.12, making the deep boil like a brazen cauldron, Job 41.31, disturbing all by his wickedness and seeking to rule over all. Insight into these things grievously wounds the demon and puts all his troops to flight, but this is possible only for those who have been in some measure purified and gained a certain vision of the inner essences of created things, whereas the impure have no insight into these essences, and even if they have been taught by others how to outwit the enemy, they will fail, because of the great clouds of dust and the turmoil 
aroused by their passions at the time of battle. For the enemy's troops must be made quiet, so that Goliath alone can face our David. In combat with all unclean thoughts, then, let us use these two methods. Analysis of the thought attacking us and the asking of questions about inner essences. 21. Whenever unclean thoughts have been driven off quickly, we should try to find out why this has happened. Did the enemy fail to overpower us because there was no possibility of the thought becoming action? Or was it because of the degree of dispassion we have attained? For example, if a solitary imagines himself entrusted with the spiritual rule of a city, he does not dwell on this thought for long because clearly it cannot be realized in practice. But if someone does become the spiritual guide of a city and yet remains unaffected, that means he is blessed with dispassion. The same criterion can be applied to other thoughts. We need to know these things in order to estimate our commitment and strength and to perceive whether we have crossed the Jordan and are near the palm trees or are still in the wilderness and harassed by the enemy. The demon of avarice, it seems to me, is extraordinarily complex and is baffling in his deceits. Often when frustrated by the strictness of our renunciation, he immediately pretends to be a steward and a lover of the poor. He urges us to prepare a welcome for strangers who have not yet arrived or to send provisions to absent brethren. He makes us mentally visit prisons in the city and ransom those on sale as slaves. He suggests that we should attach ourselves to wealthy women and advises us to be so obsequious to others who have a full purse. And so, after deceiving the soul, little by little he engulfs it in avaricious thoughts and then hands it over to the demon of self-esteem. The latter calls up in our imagination crowds of admirers who praise the Lord for the works of mercy we have performed. He makes us picture people talking to one another about how we deserve to be ordained, and he suggests to us that the present priest is bound to die before long. So our wretched intellect, entangled by these thoughts, attacks anyone who, as it imagines, opposes the idea of our ordination while on those who support the idea it lavishes gifts and flattery. Some of our critics we bring in our mind's eye before the judges and demand their expulsion from the city. As these thoughts circle in our mind, the demon of pride suddenly appears, filling our cell with lighting and visions of terror, and trying to make us mad. But let us call down destruction upon all such thoughts, and thankfully live in poverty for we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain that we can take nothing out of it. Having food and raiment, let us be content with them. 1 Timothy 6, 7-8 Remembering the words of St. Paul, Avarice is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, 10 22 all the impure thoughts that persist in us because of our passions bring the intellect down to ruin and perdition. Just as the idea of bread persists in a hungry man because of his hunger, and the idea of water in a thirsty man because of his thirst, so ideas of material things and of the shameful thoughts that follow a surfeit of food and drink persist in us because of the passions. The same is true about thoughts of self-esteem and other ideas. It is not possible for an intellect choked by such ideas to appear before God and receive the crown of righteousness. It is through being dragged down by such thoughts that the wretched intellect, like the man in the Gospels, declines the invitation to the supper of the knowledge of God. See Luke 14, 18. And the man who was bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness, see Matthew 22, 13, was clothed in a garment woven of these thoughts, and so was judged by the Lord who had invited him, not to be worthy of the wedding feast. 
For the true wedding garment is the dispassion of the deiform soul, which has renounced worldly desires. In the texts on prayer, it is explained why dwelling on ideas of sensory objects destroys true knowledge of God. 23. As we stated at the beginning, there are three chief groups of demons opposing us in the practice of the ascetic life, and after them follows the whole army of the enemy. These three groups fight in the front line, and with impure thoughts seduce our souls into wrongdoing. They are the demons set over the appetites of gluttony, those who suggest to us avaricious thoughts, and those who incite us to seek esteem in the eyes of men. If you long for pure prayer, keep guard over your insensive power, and if you desire self-restraint, control your belly and do not take your fill even of bread and water. Be vigilant in prayer and avoid all rancor. Let the teachings of the Holy Spirit be always with you and use the virtues as your hands to knock at the doors of Scripture. Then dispassion of heart will arise within you, and during prayer you will see your intellect shine like a star. Evagrios the Solitary Extracts from the Texts on Watchfulness 1. A monk should always act as if he was going to die tomorrow, yet he should treat his body as if it was going to live for many years. The first cuts off the inclination to listlessness and makes the monk more diligent. The second keeps his body sound and his self-control well balanced. 2. He who has attained spiritual knowledge and has enjoyed the delight that comes from it will no longer succumb to the demon of self-esteem, even when he offers him all the delights of the world. For what could the demon promise him that is greater than spiritual contemplation? But, so long as we have not tasted this knowledge, let us devote ourselves eagerly to the practice of the virtues, showing God that our aim in everything is to attain knowledge of Him. 3. We should examine the ways of the monks who have preceded us and achieve our purposes by following their example. One of their many helpful counsels is that a frugal and balanced diet, accompanied by the presence of love, quickly brings a monk into the harbor of dispassion. 4. Once I visited St. Macarios at noon, and burning with intense thirst I asked for a drink of water, but he said, Be satisfied with the shade, for at this moment there are many travelers who lack even that. Then, as I was telling him of my difficulties in practicing self-restraint, he said, Take heart, my son. For during the whole of twenty years I myself have never had my fill of bread, water, or sleep, but I have carefully measured my bread and water, and snatched some sleep by leaning a little against the wall. 5. Spiritual reading, vigils, and prayer bring the straying intellect to stability. Hunger, exertion, and withdrawal from the world wither burning lust. Reciting the Psalms, long-suffering and compassion curb our insensive power when it is unruly. Anything untimely or pushed to excess is short-lived and harmful rather than helpful. Evagrios the Solitary On Prayer 153 Texts Prologue when suffering from the fever of unclean passions, my intellect, afflicted with shameful thoughts, I have often been restored to health by your letters, as I used to be by the counsel of our great guide and teacher. This is not to be wondered at, since like the blessed Jacob you have earned a rich inheritance. Through your efforts to win Rachel, you have been given Leah. See Genesis 29-25. And now you seek to be given Rachel also, since you have labored a further seven years for her sake. For myself, 
I cannot deny that although I have worked hard all night, I have caught nothing. Yet, at your suggestion, I have again let down the nets, and I have made a large catch. They are not big fish, but there are a hundred and fifty-three of them. See John 21, 11. These, as you requested, I am sending you an accreel of love in the form of a hundred and fifty-three texts. I am delighted to find you so eager for texts on prayer. Eager not simply for those written on paper with ink, but also for those which are fixed in the intellect through love and generosity. But since all things go in pairs, one complementing the other, as the wise Jesus puts it, Ecclesiasticus 42, 24, please accept the letter and understand its spirit, since every written word presupposes the intellect, for where there is no intellect there is no written word. The way of prayer is also twofold. It comprises practice of the virtues and contemplation. The same applies to numbers. Literally, they are quantities, but they can also signify qualities. I have divided this discourse on prayer into 153 texts. In this way, I send you an evangelical feast, so that you may delight in a symbolical number that combines a triangular with a hexagonal figure. The triangle indicates spiritual knowledge of the Trinity. The hexagon indicates the ordered creation of the world in six days. The number 100 is square, while the number 53 is triangular and spherical, for 28 is triangular and 25 is spherical, 5 times 5 being 25. In this way, you have a square figure to express the fourfold nature of the virtues, and also a spherical number, 25, which by form represents the cyclical movement of time and so indicates true knowledge of this present age. For week follows week, and month follows month, and time revolves from year to year, and season follows season, as we see from the movement of the sun and moon, of spring and summer, and so on. The triangle can signify knowledge of the Holy Trinity, or you can regard the total sum, 153, as triangular, and so signifying respectively the practice of the virtues, contemplation of the divine in nature, and theology, or spiritual knowledge of God, faith, hope, and love. See 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. Or gold, silver, and precious stones. See 1 Corinthians 3.12. So much, then, for this number. Do not despise the humble appearance of these texts, for you know how to be content with much or little. See Philippians 4.12. You will recall how Christ did not reject the widow's mites. See Mark 12.44. But accepted them as greater than the rich gifts of many others showing in this way charity and love towards your true brethren. Pray for one who is sick, that he may take up his bed and walk. Mark 2, 11. By the grace of Christ. Amen. 1. Should one wish to make incense, one will mingle, according to the law, fragrant gum, cassia, aromatic shell, and myrrh in equal amounts. See Exodus 30. 34. These are the four virtues. With their full and balanced development, the intellect will be safe from betrayal. 2. When the soul has been purified through the keeping of all the commandments, it makes the intellect steadfast and able to receive the state needed for prayer. 3. Prayer is communion of the intellect with God. What state, then, does the intellect need? so that it can reach out to its Lord without deflection and commune with Him without intermediary. 4. When Moses tried to draw near to the burning bush, he was forbidden to approach until he had loosed his sandals from his feet. See Exodus 3.5. If, then, you wish to behold and commune with Him who is beyond sense perception and beyond concept, you must free yourself from every impassioned thought. 5. First, pray for the gift of tears, 
so that through sorrowing you may tame what is savage in your soul, and having confessed your transgressions to the Lord, you will obtain forgiveness from Him. 6. Pray with tears, and all you ask will be heard, for the Lord rejoices greatly when you pray with tears. 7. If you do shed tears during your prayer, do not exalt yourself, thinking you are better than others. For your prayer has received help, so that you can confess your sins readily and make your peace with the Lord through your tears. Therefore, do not turn the remedy for passions into a passion, and so again provoke to anger Him who has given you this grace. 8. Many people shedding tears for their sins forget what tears are for, and so, in their folly, go astray. 9. Persevere with patience in your prayer, and repulse the cares and doubts that arise within you. They disturb and trouble you, and so slacken the intensity of your prayer. 10. When the demons see you truly eager to pray, they suggest an imaginary need for various things, and then stir up your remembrance of these things, inciting the intellect to go after them. And when it fails to find them, it becomes very depressed and miserable. And when the intellect is at prayer, the demons keep filling it with the thought of these things so that it tries to discover more about them, and thus loses the fruitfulness of its prayer. 11. Try to make your intellect deaf and dumb during prayer. You will then be able to pray. 12. Whenever a temptation or a feeling of contentiousness comes over you, immediately arousing you to anger or some senseless word, remember your prayer and how you will be judged about it, and at once the disorderly movement within you will subside. 13. Whatever you do to avenge yourself against a brother who has done you a wrong will prove a stumbling block to you during prayer. 14. Prayer is the flower of gentleness and of freedom from anger. 15. Prayer is the fruit of joy and thankfulness. 16. Prayer is the remedy for gloom and despondency. 17. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor. Matthew 19.21 And deny yourself, taking up your cross. Matthew 16.24 You will then be free from distraction when you pray. 18. If you wish to pray as you should, deny yourself all the time, and when any kind of affliction troubles you, meditate on prayer. 19. If you endure something painful out of love for wisdom, you will find the fruit of this during prayer. 20. If you desire to pray as you ought, do not grieve anyone, otherwise you run in vain. Philemon 2.16 21. Leave your gift before the altar. First go away and be reconciled with your brother. Matthew 5.24. And when you return, you will pray without disturbance. For rancor darkens the intellect of one who prays and distinguishes the light of his prayers. 22. Those who store up grievances and rancor in themselves are like people who draw water and pour it into a cask full of holes. 23. If you patiently accept what comes, you will always pray with joy. 24. When you pray as you should, thoughts will come to you which make you feel that you have a real right to be angry, but anger with your neighbor is never right. If you search, you will find that things can always be arranged without anger, so do all you can not to break out into anger. 25. Take care that, while appearing to cure someone else, you yourself do not remain uncured, in this way thwarting your prayer.
26. If you are sparing with your anger, you will yourself be spared, and you will show your good sense, and will be one of those who pray. 27. If you arm yourself against anger, then you will never succumb to any kind of desire. Desire provides fuel for anger, and anger disturbs spiritual vision, disrupting the state of prayer. 28. Do not pray only with outward forms and gestures, but with reverence and awe, try to make your intellect conscious of spiritual prayer. 29. Sometimes, as soon as you start to pray, you pray well. At other times, in spite of great exertion, you do not reach your goal. This is to make you exert yourself still more, so that, having gained the gift of prayer, you keep it safe. 30. When an angel comes to us, all who trouble us withdraw at once. Then the intellect is completely calm and prays soundly. But at other times, when the attacks of the demons are particularly strong, the intellect does not have a moment's respite. This is because it is weakened by the passions to which it has succumbed in the past. But if it goes on searching, it will find. And if it knocks, the door will be opened. See Matthew 7, 8. 31. Do not pray for the fulfillment of your wishes, for they may not accord with the will of God, but pray as you have been taught, saying, Thy will be done in me. See Luke 22.42. Always entreat him in this way, that his will be done for he desires what is good and profitable for you, whereas you do not always ask for this. 32. Often when I have prayed, I have asked for what I thought was good, and persisted in my petition, stupidly importuning the will of God, and not leaving it to him to arrange things as he knows is best for me. But when I have obtained what I asked for, I have been very sorry that I did not ask for the will of God to be done, because the thing turned out not to be as I had thought. 33. What is good, except God? Then let us leave to Him everything that concerns us, and all will be well. For He who is good is naturally also the giver of good gifts. 34. Do not be distressed if you do not at once receive from God what you ask. He wishes to give you something better, to make you persevere in your prayer. For what is better than to enjoy the love of God and to be in communion with Him? 35. Undistracted prayer is the highest intellection of the intellect. 36. Prayer is the ascent of the intellect to God. 37. If you long for prayer, renounce all to gain all. 38. Pray first for the purification of the passions, secondly, for deliverance from ignorance and forgetfulness, and thirdly, for deliverance from all temptation, trial, and dereliction. 39. In your prayer, seek only the righteousness and the kingdom of God, that is, virtue and spiritual knowledge, and everything else will be given to you. Matthew 6.36 40. It is right to pray not only for your own purification, but also for that of all your fellow men, and so to imitate the angels. 41. See whether you stand truly before God in your prayer or are overcome by the desire for human praise, using prolonged prayer as a disguise. 42. Whether you pray with brethren or alone, try to pray not simply as a routine, but with conscious awareness of your prayer. 43. Conscious awareness of prayer is concentration accompanied by reverence, compunction, and distress of soul as it confesses its sins with inward sorrow. 44. If your intellect is still distracted during prayer, you do not yet know what it is to pray as a monk, 
but your prayer is still worldly, embellishing the outer tabernacle. 45. When you pray, keep close watch on your memory, so that it does not distract you with recollections of your past, but make yourself aware that you are standing before God, for by nature the intellect is apt to be carried away by memories during prayer. 46. While you are praying, the memory brings before you fantasies either of past things or of recent concerns or of the face of someone who has irritated you. 47. The demon is very envious of us when we pray and uses every kind of trick to thwart our purpose. Therefore, he is always using our memory to stir up thoughts of various things and our flesh to arouse the passions in order to obstruct our way of ascent to God. 48. When after many attempts the cunning demon fails to hinder the prayer of the righteous man, he slackens his efforts a little, and then gets his own back when the man has finished praying. Either he provokes the man to anger, and so destroys the good effects of the prayer, or else he excites him to senseless pleasure, and so degrades his intellect. 49. Having prayed as you should, expect the demon to attack you, so stand on guard, ready to protect the fruits of your prayer, for this from the start has been your appointed task to cultivate and to protect, see Genesis 2.15. Therefore, having cultivated, do not leave the fruits unprotected, otherwise you will gain nothing from your prayer. 50. The warfare between us and the demons is waged solely on account of spiritual prayer, for prayer is extremely hateful and offensive to them, whereas it leads us to salvation and peace. 51. What is it that the demons wish to excite in us? Gluttony, unchastity, avarice, anger, rancor, and the rest of the passions, so that the intellect grows coarse and cannot pray as it ought. For when the passions are aroused in the non-rational part of our nature, they do not allow the intellect to function properly. 52. We practice the virtues in order to achieve contemplation of the inner essences, lo yi, of created things, and from this we pass to contemplation of the logos, who gives them their being, and he manifests himself when we are in the state of prayer. 53. The state of prayer is one of dispassion, which by virtue of the most intense love transports to the noetic realm the intellect that longs for wisdom. 54. He who wishes to pray truly must not only control his insensive power and his desire, but must also free himself from every impassioned thought. 55. He who loves God is always communing with him as his father, repulsing every impassioned thought. 56. One who has attained dispassion has not necessarily achieved pure prayer, for he may still be occupied with thoughts which, though dispassionate, distract him and keep him far from God. 57. When the intellect no longer dallies with dispassionate thoughts about various things, it has not necessarily reached the realm of prayer, for it may still be contemplating the inner essences of these things. And though such contemplation is dispassionate, yet, since it is of created things, it impresses their forms upon the intellect and keeps it away from God. 58. If the intellect has not risen above the contemplation of the created world, it has not yet beheld the realm of God perfectly, for it may be occupied with the knowledge of intelligible things and so involved in their multiplicity. 59. If you wish to pray, you have need of God, who gives prayer to him who prays. 1 Samuel 2 9. Invoke him then, saying, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Matthew 6 9 through 10. That is, the Holy Spirit and thy only begotten Son. For so he taught us, saying, Worship the Father in spirit and in truth.
John 4.24 60. He who prays in spirit and in truth is no longer dependent on created things when honoring the Creator, but praises Him for and in Himself. 61. If you are a theologian, you will pray truly, and if you pray truly, you are a theologian. 62. When your intellect, in its great longing for God, gradually withdraws from the flesh and turns away from all thoughts that have their source in your sense perception, memory, or soul body temperament, and when it becomes full of reverence and joy, then you may conclude that you are close to the frontiers of prayer. 63. The Holy Spirit, out of compassion for our weakness, comes to us even when we are impure, and if only he finds our intellect truly praying to him, he enters it and puts to flight the whole array of thoughts and ideas circling within it, and he arouses it to a longing for spiritual prayer. 64. While all else produces thoughts, ideas, and speculations in the intellect through changes in the body, the Lord does the opposite. By entering the intellect, he fills it with whatever knowledge he wishes, and through the intellect he calms the uncontrolled impulses in the body. 65. Whoever loves true prayer, and yet becomes angry or resentful, is his own enemy. He is like a man who wants to see clearly and yet inflicts damage on his own eyes. 66. If you long to pray, do nothing that is opposed to prayer, so that God may draw near and be with you. 67. When you are praying, do not shape within yourself any image of the deity, and do not let your intellect be stamped with the impress of any form, but approach the immaterial in an immaterial manner, and then you will understand. 68. Be on your guard against the tricks of the demons. While you are praying purely and calmly, sometimes they suddenly bring before you some strange and alien form, making you imagine in your conceit that the deity is there. They are trying to persuade you that the object suddenly disclosed to you is the deity, whereas the deity does not possess quantity and form. 69. When the jealous demon fails to stir up our memory during prayer, he disturbs the soul-body temperament so as to form some strange fantasy in the intellect. Since your intellect is usually preoccupied with thoughts, it is easily diverted. Instead of pursuing immaterial and formless knowledge, it is deceived, mistaking smoke for light. 70. Stand on guard and protect your intellect from thoughts while you pray. Then your intellect will complete its prayer and continue in the tranquility that is natural to it. In this way, he who has compassion on the ignorant will come to you, and you will receive the blessed gift of prayer. 71. You cannot attain pure prayer while entangled in material things and agitated by constant cares, for prayer means the shielding of thoughts. 72. A man who is tied up cannot run, nor can the intellect that is a slave to passion perceive the realm of spiritual prayer, for it is dragged about by impassioned thoughts and cannot stay still. 73. When the intellect attains prayer that is pure and free from passion, the demons attack no longer with sinister thoughts, but with thoughts of what is good, for they suggest to it an illusion of God's glory in a form pleasing to the senses, so as to make it think that it has realized the final aim of prayer. A man who possesses spiritual knowledge has said that this illusion results from the passion of self-esteem and from the demon's touch on a certain area of the brain. 74. I think that the demon, by touching this area, changes the light surrounding the intellect as he likes. In this way, he uses the passion of self-esteem to stir up in the intellect a thought which fatuously attributes form and location to divine and principal knowledge, 
not being disturbed by impure and carnal passions, but supposing itself to be in a state of purity, the intellect imagines that there is no longer any adverse energy within it. It then mistakes for a divine manifestation the appearance produced in it by the demon, who cunningly manipulates the brain and converts the light surrounding the intellect into a form, as we have described. 75. When the angel of God comes to us, with his presence alone he puts an end to all adverse energy within the intellect and makes its light energize without illusion. 76. The statement in the Apocalypse that the angel brought incense and offered it with the prayers of the saints, see Revelations 8.3, refers, I think, to this grace which is energized through the angel, for it instills knowledge of true prayer, so that the intellect stands firm, free from all agitation, listlessness, and negligence. 77. The bowls of incense which the twenty-four elders offered are said to be the prayers of the saints. By a bowl should be understood friendship with God or perfect spiritual love, whereby prayer is energized in spirit and in truth. 78. When you think that you do not need tears for your sins during prayer, reflect on this. You should always be in God and yet you are still far from him. Then you will weep with greater feeling. 79. Surely, when you do realize where you are, you will gladly sorrow, and, like Isaiah, will reproach yourself because being unclean and dwelling in the midst of an unclean people, that is, of enemies, you dare to stand before the Lord of hosts. See Isaiah. 6 5. 80. If you pray truly, you will gain great assurance. Angels will come to you as they came to Daniel, and they will illuminate you with knowledge of the inner essences of created things. See Daniel 2 19. 81. Know that the holy angels encourage us to pray and stand beside us rejoicing and praying for us. See Tobit 12.12. 12. Therefore, if we are negligent and admit thoughts from the enemy, we greatly provoke the angels. For while they struggle hard on our behalf, we do not even take the trouble to pray to God for ourselves, but we despise their services to us, and abandoning their Lord and God, we consort with unclean demons. 82. Pray gently and calmly. Sing with understanding and rhythm. Then you will soar like a young eagle high in the heavens. 83. Psalmody calms the passions and curbs the uncontrolled impulses in the body, and prayer enables the intellect to activate its own energy. 84. Prayer is the energy which accords with the dignity of the intellect. It is the intellect's true and highest activity. 85. Psalmody appertains to the wisdom of the world of multiplicity. Prayer is the prelude to the immaterial knowledge of the One. 86. Spiritual knowledge has great beauty. It is the helpmate of prayer, awakening the noetic power of the intellect to contemplation of divine knowledge. 87. If you have not yet received the gift of prayer or psalmody, persevere patiently, and you will receive it. 88. And he spake a parable to them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. So do not lose heart and despair because you have not yet received the gift of prayer. You will receive it later. In the same parable we read, Though I do not fear God or man's opinion, yet because this widow troubles me, I will vindicate her. Similarly, God will speedily vindicate those who cry to him day and night. See Luke 18, 1-8. Take heart, then, and persevere diligently in holy prayer. 89. 
you should wish for your affairs to turn out not as you think best, but according to God's will. Then you will be undisturbed and thankful in your prayer. 90. Even if you think you are with God, be on your guard against the demon of unchastity, for he is very wily and jealous. He tries to outwit the activity and watchfulness of your intellect and to draw it away from God when it stands before him with reverence and fear. 91. If you cultivate prayer, be ready for the attacks of demons and endure them resolutely, for they will come at you like wild beasts and maltreat your whole body. 92. Prepare yourself like an experienced fighter, and even if you see a sudden apparition, do not be shaken, and should you see a sword drawn against you, or a torch thrust in your face, do not be alarmed. Should you see even some loathsome and bloody figure, do not panic, but stand fast, boldly affirming your faith, and you will be more resolute in confronting your enemies. 93. He who bears distress patiently will attain joy, and he who endures the repulsive will know delight. 94. Take care that the crafty demons do not deceive you with some vision. Be on your guard, turn to prayer, and ask God to show you if the intellection comes from him, and, if it does not, to dispel the illusion at once. Do not be afraid, for if you pray fervently to God, the demons will retreat, lashed by his unseen power. 95. You should be aware of this trick. At times, the demons split into two groups, and when you call for help against one group, the other will come in the guise of angels and drive away the first, so that you are deceived into believing that they are truly angels. 96. Cultivate great humility and courage, and you will escape the power of the demons. No plague shall come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you. Psalms 91, 10-11 And they will invisibly repel all the energy of the enemy. 97. He who practices pure prayer will hear the demons crashing and banging, shouting and cursing, yet he will not be overwhelmed or go out of his mind, but he will say to God, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalms 23.4 And other words of this kind. 98. At the time of such trials, use a brief but intense prayer. 99. If the demons suddenly threaten to appear out of the air, to make you panic, and to take possession of your intellect, do not be frightened and pay no attention to their threats, for they are trying to terrify you, to see if you take notice of them or scorn them utterly. 100. When you stand in prayer before God the Almighty, who created all things and takes thought for all, why are you so foolish as to forget the fear of God and to be scared of mosquitoes and cockroaches? Have you not heard it said, You shall fear the Lord your God? Deuteronomy 6.13 or again, fear and dread shall fall upon them. Exodus 15, 16. 101. Bread is food for the body, and holiness is food for the soul. Spiritual prayer is food for the intellect. 102. When you are in the inner temple, pray, not as the Pharisee, but as the publican, so that you too are set free by the Lord. See Luke 18, 10 through 14. 103. Try not to pray against anyone in your prayer, so that you do not destroy what you are building and make your prayer loathsome. 104. Learn from the man who owed the ten thousand talents that if you do not forgive your debtor, you yourself will not be forgiven, for it is said, he delivered him to the tormentors. Matthew 18.34 105. Detach yourself from concern for the body when you pray. Do not let the sting of a flea or a fly, 
the bite of a louse or a mosquito deprive you of the fruits of your prayer? 106. We have heard that the evil one attacked a certain saint so fiercely as he prayed, that, when the saint lifted up his hands, the evil one changed himself into a lion, and raising his front legs, fixed his claws into the saint's thighs, and he kept them there, until the saint lowered his hands, which was only when he had come to the end of his usual prayers. 107. There is, too, the case of that great monk, John the Small. He lived the hesychastic life in a pit, and his communion with God was not interrupted, even when a demon in the form of a serpent wound itself round him, chewed his flesh, and spat it out into his face. 108. You have surely read the lives of the monks of Tabernesis, when Abba Theodore was preaching to the brethren, Two vipers crawled under his feet, but he calmly made an arch of his feet and let them stay there until he had finished his sermon. Then he showed the vipers to the brethren and told them what had happened. 109. We read how, when another spiritual brother was praying, a viper came and wound itself round his leg, but he did not lower his hands until he had finished all his usual prayers and because he loved God more than himself, he was not harmed at all. 110. Do not let your eyes be distracted during prayer, but detach yourself from concern with body and soul, and give all your attention to the intellect. 111. Another saint living the hesychastic life in the desert was attacked as he was praying by demons who for two weeks tossed him like a ball in the air, catching him in his rush mat. They were completely unsuccessful in distracting his mind from fiery prayer. 112. When another monk was practicing inner prayer as he journeyed in the desert, two angels came and walked on either side of him, but he paid no heed to them, for he did not wish to lose what was better. He remembered the words of the apostle, Neither angels nor principalities nor powers shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Romans 8, 38-39 113. The monk becomes equal to the angels through prayer because of his longing to behold the face of the Father who is in heaven. See Matthew 18, 10. 114. Never try to see a form or shape during prayer. 115. Do not long to have a sensory image of angels or powers or Christ, for this would be madness. It would be to take a wolf as your shepherd and to worship your enemies, the demons. 116. Self-esteem is the start of illusions in the intellect. Under its impulse, the intellect attempts to enclose the deity in shapes and forms. 117. I shall say again what I have said elsewhere. Blessed is the intellect that is completely free from forms during prayer. 118. Blessed is the intellect that, undistracted in its prayer, acquires an ever greater longing for God. 119. Blessed is the intellect that during prayer is free from materiality and stripped of all possessions. 120. Blessed is the intellect that has acquired complete freedom from sensations during prayer. 121. Blessed is the monk who regards every man as God after God. 122. Blessed is the monk who looks with great joy on everyone's salvation and progress as if they were his own. 123. Blessed is the monk who regards himself as the offscouring of all things. 1 Corinthians 4.13 124. A monk is one who is separated from all and united with all. 125. 
A monk is one who regards himself as linked with every man through always seeing himself in each. 126. The man who always dedicates his first thoughts to God has perfect prayer. 127. If you want to pray as a monk, shun all lies and take no oath, otherwise you vainly pretend to be what you are not. 128. If you wish to pray in spirit, be detached from the flesh, and no cloud will darken you during prayer. 129. Entrust to God the needs of your body, and it will be clear that you entrust to Him the needs of your spirit also. 130. If you receive what has been promised, you will reign over all things, and keeping these promises in your mind, you will gladly endure your present poverty, spiritual and material. 131. Do not shun poverty and affliction, the fuel that gives wings to prayer. 132. Let the virtues of the body lead you to those of the soul, and the virtues of the soul to those of the spirit, and these in turn to immaterial and principal knowledge. 133. If you are praying to overcome some thought, and it subsides easily, examine carefully how this came about. Otherwise, you may be deluded into attributing the cause to yourself. 134. There are times when the demon suggests thoughts to you, and then urge you to rebut them with prayer, whereupon they withdraw of their own accord, so as to deceive you into imagining that you have begun to overcome such thoughts and to rout the demons. 135. If you pray to overcome a passion or a demon who is troubling you, remember the words, I will pursue my enemies and overtake them, and I will not turn back until they are consumed. I will dash them to pieces, and they shall not be able to stand. They shall fall under my feet. Psalms 18, 37-38 Say this when needed, and so arm yourself with humility against your enemies. 136. Do not think that you have acquired holiness unless you have reached the point of shedding your blood to attain it. For according to the Apostle, we must battle unremittingly against sin, even if it means death. See Ephesians 6, 11-17 and Hebrews 12, 4. 137. If you do good to one person, you may be wronged by another, and so feel injured, and say or do something stupid, thus dissipating by your bad action what you gained by your good action. This is just what the demons want, so always be attentive. 138. Be ready for the attacks of the demons, and think how to avoid becoming their slave. 139. At night, the cunning demons try to disturb the spiritual teacher by direct attack. In the daytime, they attack him through other people, besieging him with slander, distraction, and danger. 140. Do not try to avoid the fullers. Let them beat, trample, stretch, and smooth, and your garments will be all the brighter. 141. So long as you have not renounced the passions, and your intellect is still opposed to holiness and truth, you will not find the fragrance of incense in your breast. 142. Do you have a longing for prayer? Then leave the things of this world and live your life in heaven, not just theoretically, but in angelic action and godlike knowledge. 143. If it is only in times of adversity that you remember the judge and how awe-inspiring and impartial he is, you have not yet learned to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice in him with trembling. Psalms 2.11 For even in a state of spiritual peace and blessedness, you should still worship him with reverence and awe. 144. Until a man is completely changed by repentance, 
He will be wise always to remember his sins with sorrow and to recall the eternal fire which they justly deserve. 145. If a man, still enmeshed in sin and anger, dares shamelessly to reach out for knowledge of divine things, or even to embark upon immaterial prayer, he deserves the rebuke given by the apostle, for it is dangerous for him to pray with head bare and uncovered. Such a soul, he says, ought to have a veil on her head because of the angels who are present. See 1 Corinthians 11, 5-7, and to be clothed in due reverence and humility. 146. Just as persistent staring at the sun and its noonday brilliance will not cure a man suffering from ophthalmia, so the counterfeit practice of fearful and supernal prayer, which is properly to be performed in spirit and in truth, will in no way benefit an intellect that is passionate and impure. On the contrary, such practice will provoke the wrath of God against the intellect. 147. If he who is in want of nothing and shows no favors did not receive the man coming with a gift to the altar until he was reconciled with his neighbor who had something against him, see Matthew 5, 23-24, consider how much we must be on guard and use discrimination if we are to offer at the spiritual altar incense that is acceptable to God. 148. Do not delight in words or in glory, otherwise the demons will no longer work behind your back, but openly before your face, and they will laugh you to scorn during prayer, drawing you away and enticing you into strange thoughts. 149. If you seek prayer attentively, you will find it. For nothing is more essential to prayer than attentiveness, so do all you can to acquire it. 150. As sight is superior to all the other senses, so prayer is more divine than all the other virtues. 151. The value of prayer lies not in mere quantity, but in its quality. This is shown by the contrast of the two men who went up into the temple. See Luke 18.10, and by the injunction, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Matthew 6, 7. 152. So long as you give attention to the beauty of the body and your intellect delights in the outside of the tabernacle, you have not yet perceived the realm of prayer and are still far from treading its blessed path. 153. If when praying, no other joy can attract you, then truly you have found prayer.